Amen, church. You guys can be seated. How y'all doing today? All right. Two people are excited. That's what's up. Must have been a good Valentine's Day for them. All right. Anybody still single? It's just a season. Seasons come and seasons go. Listen, we are excited that you are here. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Chris, and I am the pastor here at Crossroads Church. And I just want to say, if this is your very first time hanging out with us, you are our honored guest. And so we love first-time guests. We love them even more when they become second-time guests and third-time guests and so forth and so on. Um, But we are excited for you to be here today. We've been tracking through this series called Bridges. We're trying to build some bridges. And before I get into that, there's a couple of things I want to hit. Um, One, how many of you um, had signed up to be a part of a community crew in the past couple of weeks? Amen. How many of you actually took part in a community crew this past week? Hey, I did too. You can put your hands down. And can I tell you, I haven't laughed um, so hard in a long time because there was nothing like getting together with a few families uh, in my home and sitting around and hearing how they all met. And um, we got some jacked up people in this church, y'all. Just being honest with you. Man, I thought my story was crazy. Uh, I'm kidding, kind of. Um, So, but I had so much fun just getting to like get to know some of our people better, their story, and then to to get into God's word and to hear and to go a little deeper from what Josh preached on this past Sunday, uh, it did my heart good. So listen, I want to encourage you, if you have not signed up yet to be a part of a community crew, it's our small group ministry here at Crossroads Church, I believe you're missing out. So um, you can take out your phone right now and you can sign up or you can do it after the service, whatever. If you're just an overachiever, you can do it now. Um, I want to encourage you. Take that step. It'll be well worth the while. It just allows our faith to grow a little bit deeper throughout the week and for God to solidify some things. And so um, we want you to partner with us in that. And if you're on the fence, just talk to somebody who has, sorry, this is a brand new mic in last service. If I moved, it was like, you hear that? I might have to go handheld. This is going to drive me insane. Y'all, that is impossible. That's like, asking, that's like asking it not to rain in North Carolina. It just happens. Um, yeah, okay, I'll try to walk slowly. I won't turn my head real fast. Um, so another thing that I'm, y'all hear it? Is it annoying y'all or y'all good with it? Say the word, I'll rip it off. So um, here we go. So we've had this series scripture that we have been learning. How many of you have learned 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5? Raise your hand if you own it. Okay, two and a half hands. So listen, how many of you, just being honest, because we're in church, you forgot about it. Raise your hand if you forgot. Own it. Yes, thank you. Okay, honesty is the best policy. Here's the deal. Just like last month, our series scripture was Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25, which says this, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. So we're going to pause right there, because I know you know the rest of it. It's our job. Listen, life happens. We're not here to judge you because you didn't learn the verse this week. It is what it is. Life comes at you, and sometimes you feel like you're boxing, and you're just trying not to get hit. So it's our job um, to encourage one another, and so I want you to say it with me. We have a series passage of Scripture. Is it my glasses? Now I can't. Now y'all just fuzzy. So here's what the Scripture says. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. I'm not going to look at it on the screen. I'm not going to look at it on the monitors up there either. So I'm going to try to focus, and we're going to say it together. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Oh, you guys sound good. it's, It's actually a pretty easy verse to memorize. I called Josh this past week. We were talking on the phone, and before I got off, I said, Josh, you're the man. He said, nope, Jesus is the man. I was like, thank you for correcting me. You are a close second. And that I believe, I, I mean that with all my heart. And so I want to encourage you guys, as we move through bridges, there is one mediator. You and I need help. You and I do, do not have access to God in and of our own selves. There is a mediator and his name is Jesus. And so if you have your Bibles today, 
Go ahead and open it up and turn with me to the book of John, chapter 4. John, chapter 4. It is in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, Juan. See how fast you are. John, chapter 4, verse 1. If you're there, stand up. I'm kidding. You don't have to stand up. Like sword drill. That would be awesome. I have to bring that back sometime. So John chapter 4, verse 1, while you guys are turning there, um, back in, uh, in Jesus' day, people stumbled all over Jesus. And the more I think about it, I feel like people are still stumbling all over Jesus. Amen? Um, in Jesus' day, especially in this particular time period, in John chapter 4, they were, they were divided in their opinions of him. And I think people are still divided in their opinions over Jesus today. Um, which is ironic because when Jesus came, he came to bring unity. He didn't come to bring division. The whole purpose of Jesus coming was to get people, sinful man, from here to their holy God. Jesus came to bring unity between a broken relationship between sinful man and holy God. But oftentimes when we talk about Jesus, there is some type of division. And so the debate in scripture often centered on his bridge building practice. Jesus had some different practices because the church people, the the Jews of that day, the Pharisees, the the church leaders didn't like Jesus's practices the way he tried to move people from here towards there because Jesus was a bridge builder. And we learned a couple of weeks ago that the gospel is always a bridge. The gospel is never a wall. So Jesus is always trying to bridge the gap. He is the bridge. He's the mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. And so let's jump right into scripture and let's see what's going on in this passage. Y'all with me? Y'all excited? Give me an amen and I'll cut off a couple minutes off the sermon, okay? There you go. Now we're going. Where are we going to eat? All right. So John chapter 4, verse 1, here's what scripture says. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. So we see in this story, as we pause for just a second, that Jesus is in this area called Judea. And, um, and Jesus is wanting to leave now, when we think about words like leave uh, or left, like when Jesus left Judea, we would think like, all right, peace out, I'm, I'm gone, I'm just like leaving this area, I'm, I'm moving on. But in the Greek, this word actually meant something a little bit differently. The word left here means to forsake or to abandon. And we know that Jesus wasn't just forsaking Judea, which the name Judea means land of the Jews, and so he wasn't forsaking or abandoning Judea. Judea itself as a location, but what he was doing is there was a growing controversy in that area, and a controversy is a prolonged disagreement, a very public and heated disagreement, and so Jesus is forsaking this area, and he's leaving. He wants to abandon this certain controversy. See, the religious people of that day were distressed over a rivalry between John the Baptist and between Jesus. Who is baptizing more people? In my personal walk, I've been working through the book of Mark. Um, And in Mark chapter 1, it says that John the Baptist, he had come to prepare the way for Jesus. And so he was living in the wilderness, this kind of this weird character, and he dressed really, really funny. Um, wore camel's hair, ate wild locusts and, and, and honey. And, but all of the people of Judea, it says all of Judea were coming out to see this, this show. And many people were repenting of their sins and John was baptizing them. And so now Jesus comes on the scene and his 
earthly ministry starts. And now Jesus is preaching and going from town to town, teaching people to repent from their sins. And they are also getting baptized. He's having his disciples baptize them. And so now the religious people, they're super stressed over a controversy of who is baptizing more people. In 2021, I wonder if the church, not necessarily Crossroads, but maybe some, how much of the church is having these heated debates over controversial stuff that maybe we shouldn't be focused on. I don't know. Just the culture that we're in, I feel like it might be a lot. So Jesus walking away from the controversy, it actually indicates its lack of true significance or importance. The fact that Jesus was here and he's like, I'm going to leave this because it's, it's not important. And so we see here today that what Jesus was walking towards was more important than what he was walking away from. What Jesus was walking towards was far more important than what he was walking away from. And if you've been hanging out with us, uh, the month of January, we worked through our mission, vision, and our values. And week one, we talked about our mission. And our mission, if you're with me, is loving and leading people to life in Jesus together. Jesus modeled this because when he called the disciples, Jesus is walking by the Sea of Galilee. And there's some men, fishermen. And Jesus says what to them? You remember two words. Follow me. And then he says, I'll make you fishers of men if you'll follow me. Because Jesus knew that where he was walking towards was far, far greater than where he was walking from. And he wanted the disciples to get this. The disciples, in their moment, they're in their lives, they feel probably passed over because no rabbi had asked them to follow them. They've been passed over. They're, they're kind of bottom of the barrel. They're bluest blue collars you can get. We're just fishermen. It's what we do. It doesn't make a lot of money. We're just ordinary, run-of-the-mill people. And Jesus sees them and he says, hey, will you follow me? If you'll follow me, I'm going somewhere. Because to follow me implies that he's fixing to move to another location. So Jesus gives them an opportunity. He gives them an opportunity to say, you know what? Where he's walking towards is far greater than, than where I'm at. And so that's the call that God has for you and I today in 2021. Where Jesus is going, where he's walking where he's saying, hey, church, Benson, will you follow me? I'll make you fishers of men. So what was Jesus walking towards? So we, he wasn't walking towards Samaria. Scripture says he was going to Galilee. So he's going from the land of the Jews, right, the, where the Pharisees had this controversy. These religious leaders were debating over who baptizes more, and, and Jesus knows that he's on mission. He's very clear about his mission. We're going to see this here in just a moment in Scripture. His mission was to do his Father's will. And so as he leaves, he's heading to Galilee. And this was Jesus' home. This was his hometown. And he's going. And I love how in Scripture says he, he must pass through Samaria. So I want, to, I want to put a picture on the screen just so you guys give you a little bit of uh, like a little history, or not history, uh, geography lesson. Well, oh, there they go. That was quick. All right, so anybody been to Israel? Okay, gosh. Uh, that, I want to go so bad. Once COVID is completely like obliterated, if that ever happens, wouldn't it be awesome if we took a church trip to Israel? Yes. Amen. <laughs> yeah, buddy. Let's try to make that happen. So um, for now, we'll look at our little coloring book uh, map. Um, thank you, Google. So Judea is down here in the teal, if you guys can see that. And then up top here up the north is Galilee. So Jesus is in this area, and he wants to go to Galilee. And so in order to get to Galilee, he, he's got to go through Samaria, right? So he goes fastest point from, or from A to B is like straight line. So he says, I've got to go through Samaria. And that's about a 70-mile trip. It's about a 70-mile hike. If you guys will make sure to leave that... Um, graphic up just for a little bit. So it's a 70 mile 
Like they didn't have Ubers, they didn't have like Amtrak, they didn't have a quick little jet they could hop on. It's 70 miles and it was about a two and a half day journey. So two and a half days you'd get there if you went straight from Judea to Galilee. So Jesus was just going to go straight to where his destination was and he had to pass through this area of, of Samaria, area of Samaria. It's like poet didn't know it, okay? See where my mind's tracking. The Jews, however, the Jews did not um, go the same way that Jesus does. They had an issue with Samaria because the Jews hated the Samaritans, the people that were living in this area. They, they loathed them. They despised them. They would be fine if they were dead. If they were on the side of the road, they wouldn't stop to help them. If they had been beaten and um, just in inches of their life, they would look at them and then just keep, they might not even look at them. They'd just keep moving. Because the Samaritans were, they were considered half-breeds. So you had the Jews, if you were a Jew and you married a Gentile, and then you had a, a, a child, now that was a Samaritan because it was a mix between Jews and Gentiles. They already didn't care for the Gentiles, but they really despised Samaritans. So here's what the Jews would do. The Jews would go from Judea over to Perea and then up to Decapolis, and then they would hit Galilee, and they would kind of, Jesus would go straight and the Jews would sidestep. They would kind of, so they saw the area of Samaria as a problem, problem people. I don't like them. So they would sidestep their problem, and Jesus would go straight to the problem. So the big thing about this is this not only cost the Jews, they, they, they couldn't stand the Samaritans. So what they would do is they would actually double their time. So instead of going 70 miles, this would be closer to double that, closer to 140 miles. It wouldn't just take two and a half days. It would take five days to get there. What Jesus was doing is he's building a bridge. He's going straight from Judea to Galilee, and he's building a bridge right over Samaria. And the Jews are building walls. The Jews are building walls because it's people we don't want to deal with. We're willing to inconvenience ourselves and go way out of the way to avoid having to deal with these people. But that's not the gospel. Because see, the gospel is always a bridge. The gospel is never a wall. And this is just a, a complete side note. I believe that there are issues in our lives that each one of us have our own little Samaria. And I don't know what your Samaria is, but we've all got one. There are areas in your life that rather than build a bridge, you know what we do? We slap that wall up quick. I'll go out of my way to not have to deal with this issue. I don't know yours, but you know it. And I've already prayed that the Holy Spirit would reveal it to you right now. Because he's revealed me some in mine. Can I tell you that although sometimes it may seem easier to build, to build walls, it's just faster, right? I can protect myself. I don't want my heart to get hurt. I, wanna, I, I, want, I want to keep my privacy. Building walls. Building Building walls always costs you more than building bridges. It will always hurt you more. Because in scripture, it said that Jesus, when he got to Samaria, to this well, he was what? You remember the word? Wearied. Jesus was tired. Listen, if the Son of God gets tired building bridges, can I tell you, don't be surprised if you get tired. It's going to happen. I wish the Christian life was easy. It's actually really hard. It's really hard because God asked me to do things that I don't necessarily want to do. But God knows it's the right thing to do to always build bridges. So think about it. When you try to protect yourself and do things your way by simply throwing up walls, you know what has to happen before you can actually build a bridge? That wall has to be torn down. Sometimes it's got to be kicked down, bulldozed. It takes time, effort, resources exhaustion. Many of us in our lives have so many walls and it's going to cost you far more to build walls than it would if you would just simply build a bridge. Does that make sense? You guys with me? All right, so let's go on here. Look at verse 7. This is where it starts getting really awesome. So they get to this well. Verse 7, a woman from Samaria came to draw water and Jesus said to her, uh, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how, hold on, okay, so anybody talk with their hands? Like, I'm, like, okay, like, 
Like, if you got to, like, I'm thankful my wife does not do that. She's never been like, if you, you know. Anyway, I feel like this Samaritan woman, I might be, like, maybe reading too much into this. But the way that she talks to Jesus, it's almost like she's, I can see a little sass in her. So, here, so here's what it goes. She says this. How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Can you see her shaking her head? Because think about last week when Josh talked about the culture, right? The culture that was existing at that time period and and just how women were very low on the totem pole. They were not considered equal. Not only that, but she's she's a Samaritan woman. And we already know how they feel about Samaritans. Now look at Jesus' response. This is so good. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, well, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So what Jesus is offering to us is greater than what he wants from us. What Jesus is offering to us is greater than what he wants from us. Jesus did what no one else would do to these Samaritans. He shocked the woman because the fact that he was a Jew and he was a teacher, he was a rabbi, he comes up, broad daylight, woman, Samaritan, and he speaks to her and he actually treats her with dignity. And he treats her with respect and this lady is shown compassion that she's never experienced from another Jew well now he's got her attention so we see that Jesus he's trying to build a bridge where other people won't go what other people won't do who other people won't speak to Jesus, what is the model that he set for you and I? He builds a bridge. And he goes and he has a conversation. You see, I believe in 2021 there's still Samaritans. But it's not necessarily this group of people that we're talking about here. There are groups of people in our community that if Christians actually went and talked to them with dignity and talked to them with respect, excuse me, and, and they were shown compassion, I believe there are groups of people that if they were shown compassion, and they've never been shown compassion recently by the church, they would say, they would be something like, why, why, are, you, why are you talking? Why are you talking to me? You know, there's so many different, like, issues going on in our, in our community. Shoot, for that matter, in our families. <laughs> we got a lot. We got a lot of problems. There are people in Benson right now that I can think of that are struggling with big issues. Drugs, alcohol, homosexuality, struggling with their gender. Listen, in a, in a crowd this size, it might be some of you. Can I tell you how much I love you? Can I tell you how much I care for you? And we care for you as a church, if that's you. Maybe you're watching online. You might not even be in the state of North Carolina. Can I tell you, you are loved. You see, those are the bridges that Jesus, he goes and he talks to people that everybody else ignores. If we were to go to some of those people here in Benson and ask them, do you feel respected by the church? Do you feel like the church has shown you compassion? What would they say? Church, we haven't. We have a huge opportunity to change that. Amen? But it takes work. So look, he goes on. So Jesus is there and he's having this interaction. It would be easy for us to just focus on the woman at the well. I want to change that. Who else was with Jesus when he went to Samaria, right? Who was he traveling with? Disciples, his homeboys, right? Because originally Jesus, when he called them, he said, hey, if you'll follow me, I'll make you fishers of men, right? We're going like, to change the world. I want you to learn from me. Where were the disciples? Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A. 
They, the very reason that Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Follow me and I will teach you. I will show you. When it comes down to it, the very guys that said, all right, show us, teach us, nowhere to be found. They're getting, they're getting food. Jesus is there to build bridges with people. And the disciples, their main focus was trying to take care of God. Which sounds like a noble thing, right? Can you imagine being a disciple of Jesus? You're like, oh my gosh, you are God in flesh. Creator of everything. I can hug your neck. Do you need anything? I think it would only be natural, like if Jesus was here, like if in flesh, and I could touch God, King of kings, Lord of lords, do you need a shoulder? Like, are you aching anywhere? I will rub your feet. What do you need, Jesus? You sit there. Don't you, don't you pick up anything. I will do the dishes. Can you imagine? It would, it would only be natural for us to want to take care of God. I just want to tell you today, God doesn't need you to take care of him. We need to think about that long and hard. Our job is not to try to make God's like existence comfy. Because in scripture we learn that Jesus, when he came, he didn't come to be served. There's a reason why that was put in scripture for us to read that, listen, I'm not here to be served. I'm here to serve others. And I'm here to set an example for us as Christians. Guess what we're supposed to do? We're not here to, to serve ourselves. We're here to serve others. It's what Jesus modeled. God doesn't need us to take care of him. Do you know that God doesn't need us to defend him either? That's a big one. I feel like there's a line in the saying, I got to defend my heavenly father. No, you don't. God's never once called me to police him. I'm really good at being Chris, jacked up, messed up Chris. God's really good at being awesome, powerful, almighty, omniscient, like you, the list goes on, at God. God's really good at being God. Let him be God. And in the meantime, we need to learn from his example and see what he's said. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip the conversation between Jesus and this woman, okay? Here's where my shameless pug for a community crew. Your community crews this week, we're actually going to work through the passage of Scripture that Jesus is talking with this woman. And it is crazy because he knows everything about her to the, like, smallest little detail. And her mind is blown. I don't want to tell you anymore. You need to sign up for a community crew because that's our Scripture this week. Anyway, we're fast-forwarding to verse 27. Okay, here we go. So, verse 27, I hope I've got you like, what happened? Like, that's, that's the whole point. John 4, 27, just then his disciples came back and they marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So they come back with a number one, two, with a lemonade, two packs of mayonnaise. In heaven, Chick-fil-A will be open on Sunday. I can promise you that. Just throwing that out there. Come on, Jesus. You can come through. You can do anything you want to. But I believe that oftentimes we're so focused on taking care of God, church, and making sure that he's okay or making sure that our needs are met rather than what other needs are met that we miss the opportunity to build so many bridges in life. I think the, the disciples are a great illustration of that. And so it's our mission here. Crossroads Church exists to love and to lead people to life in Jesus together. So when Jesus, he says, follow me, and he's, where Jesus is walk, what Jesus is walking towards is greater than what he's walking from. Can I just ask you today, church, what are you walking towards? Think about it. What's your focus been? Has it just been the things of this world? Is it like my job? Is it my family problem? Is it my kids are acting up? Like what, what's your focus? What are you, maybe it's the American dream. I don't know, but what are you walking towards? We're walking towards something daily, weekly, every month. We're walking towards something. Look at verse 28. So Jesus has this interaction. And so the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, okay, hold on, pause. <laughs> when Jesus called the disciples and he said, follow me, they were fishing, correct? What did they leave? 
their nets, right, their livelihood. So when the woman left, what did she leave? Her water jar. I'm telling you, when Jesus calls you to do something and we follow him, there's something, there's got to be a void. Because Jesus is filling this void. People are all the time leaving stuff. You know, there's probably people that follow Jesus just to scoop up, like, oh, there's some fishing nets. There's a water jar. Look at verse 29. This lady, she goes into the town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And they went out of the town, and they were coming to him. So imagine this. This lady has an interaction with Jesus, and something has, like, lit her fire. She goes back to the whole town and says, y'all are not going to believe who I have met. Y'all got to come. Come on, drop what you're doing. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Follow me. Now she's doing what Jesus did to the disciples. She's saying, follow you got to come on, come on. So they're walking down the road. And in the meantime, meanwhile, verse 31, the disciples were urging him saying, Rabbi, eat. I, I, just, I know it sounded just like that. Would you eat? They're wanting to take care of God, right? And what's Jesus wanting to do? He's wanting to take care of people. This is just a little extra. This has not a whole lot to do with my sermon. Be careful with who you surround yourself with. And I'm talking your specific inner circle of your Christian accountability partners. Because if you're surrounding yourself with people that are just trying to help you be comfortable in your walk with Jesus, you need new friends. We got to hear this. Because the disciples are sitting there saying, oh, Jesus, take, no, no, it's take it easy. And you know what Jesus is doing? We're fixing to see it because this is really, really good as we wrap this thing up. Jesus is so focused on the mission. He's there for a purpose. And they're like, listen, eat up. We supersized it. It's a good thing to want to do good things for God, but it's... If it's at the expense of doing what, like forsaking what God has for you to do, then we don't need to do it. Listen to what he says. Verse 32. Jesus responds to them, but he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Are you kidding me right now? You remember controversy? Jesus just left Judea. Because people are arguing over who's baptizing more people. And then now right here, they're like, who brought him something to eat? That's our job. What is that? Is, is that Bojangles? Are you kidding me? We got him Chick-fil-A. <laughs> Bojangles. Are, that's their main focus. Who brought him something to eat? Do you see how controversial that could be? That the fact that Jesus is here trying to love on people that are so far away from God, that need to be loved, that need to have a bridge built. And the disciples are like, so focused on God. What if we were a church that was so focused on God that we didn't do anything that God asked us to do? Wouldn't that be a travesty? To get to heaven one day and be like, God, we did a great job. Like, ah, you missed it a little, bud. Love you, but I don't want to be that church. Verse 34, Jesus responds to them. He said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. If the food that was for Jesus is to do the will of him that sent him and to accomplish his work, what do you think our food should be? To do the will of whom he sent us and to do and accomplish his work. Are you with me on that? Do you feel like there's a gray area? Because if so, please tell me. That is our responsibility. That is the example that has been set for you and for me, is that we are to be Christ-like. Now, no, we'll never hang on a cross like Jesus did, but we will die to ourselves daily, or at least we should. Because it's all about doing the Father's will and accomplishing the work that he wants to accomplish in us and through us. It makes a lot of sense. Matthew 4.4, 4, Jesus said this, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth 
of God. What's every word that comes from the mouth of God? There you go. Somebody raised it high. Scripture. You want to know what God says? Read it. It's there. He left it. It's his love letter for us. We can't live by bread alone. He's saying, listen, don't get wrapped up in this world because you can't live by that. Oh, you can eat a little bit, but it ain't going to last. You have to eat more. You're going to die eventually. But, but every word, you'll live by every word that comes out of my mouth. So now it makes a little bit more sense when we start to learn Scripture. Hebrews and 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, and we're hiding God's Word in our heart that we might not sin against God. And, and we want to use this Scripture to impact our community and have heart transformation. So what are we doing in 2021? Are we trying our best to be our best for Jesus? We try and just not to sin as much as we can or try not to say as many bad words as we can or trying to behave as much as we can. Our purpose in life is not to take care of God, but to look after and take care of people. You remember the lawyer? Here's what he said. Teacher, what's the greatest commandment? He says, love God and love people. You won't ever love people until you first love God. That's why Jesus is the way, right? Jesus is our way. We start our way with Jesus. and He's our everything. But we cannot lose sight of people. Do you know God is obsessed with people? But unfortunately, in 2021, we've become a society that's obsessed with ourselves. We are. I don't need to camp there, but. We are, we're so individually focused that we forget about the mission that God's calling us to do. Again, God didn't come to be served, but to serve. Our job is not to protect God. You remember the night, so many of you, if you've been from a church background, the night that Jesus was betrayed, Peter tried to protect Jesus and in essence, really try to keep him from doing his father's will because he was willing to die, pulled out a sword and cut a man's ear off trying to keep Jesus from being taken. And what did Jesus tell him to do? Put your sword up or I have got this. As a matter of fact, my eyes are on the prize. My eyes are on doing and accomplishing the will of the father who sent me. You know what we, here's what we need to do as a church. We need to have our eyes focused and we can't let anything take us off of our mission it's mission critical last verse and then i'm done john 4 35 we're going to jump down listen to what jesus said because he uses this illustration he says do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest look i tell you lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Now, I don't know what the area around Jacob's well looked like, but I know that's where they were at. And you can actually visit that area. If we go to Israel one day, we're going to speak that into existence. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. But I can only imagine what Jesus did because Jesus used the physical to help us understand the spiritual. But I want to take it one step further. I believe that around that well, you could see fields that were they're white for harvest. They're ready. Is it, are you, I just need somebody to go out and harvest it, to reap it. It's already grown. It's already produced fruit. I don't know if it was grain. I, I don't know what it would have been, but it's already ready. You know, Scripture says the, the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers, well, there's, there's few. There's so much crop to be harvested, but the laborers the people that are willing to go out and do the work, build bridges, not walls, they're few. But I can only imagine, because you remember just a couple of verses before, in the meantime, remember the lady who went to get her town? She's bringing the whole town with her, right? You got to come meet this guy. So it would be easy for us to just look at this and say, Jesus says, look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. What if, just what if, I don't know if this happened or not, but it would be awesome if it did. What if Jesus looked down the road and he could see that lady 
walking back with hundreds of people from her town. And Jesus, you know what he would tell the disciples? Hey, look. Look, I tell you. Lift up your eyes and see. Don't be blinded. Don't be fooled. Look, look, look. Look what's coming. Look and see that the fields are white for harvest. People coming towards them. And Jesus is like, it's not about feeding me. It's not about taking care of me. Guys, I want you to see what's in front of you. And I just can't help but think there's a whole community. If we could open up those double doors and I could look out across the dog park, amen, like to the homes behind Food Lion and just all of the cars driving by on 95. And it's like if Jesus was here, I almost would think he'd say, church, look up. Look, look, look right there. You're, look, the fields, they're, they're ready. But I need somebody who's ready to, to accomplish the will of God and to, to go to work. Are you with me, church? You see what's going on here? Jesus is challenging us. Listen, Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. I'm probably going to say it every week because I love the passage of Scripture. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see what? Do you know what the day drawing near is? Oh, it's a glorious day for those of us that are saved. I'm looking forward to it. No more back pain. No more getting sore from bowling. No more headaches. No more getting texts from people that have cancer that need prayer. The day's drawing near, church. And we have a huge responsibility. And God has entrusted us with this incredible message of the good news of Jesus Christ. That there is a bridge that spans from here to there, an unreachable place where God is. So sinful, jacked up, messed up man, through this one mediator, this one man named Jesus, the Son of God, who came to pay the penalty for your sin and mine. No matter what you've done, no matter what you've said, no matter where you've been, you cannot outrun the love of Jesus. His blood paid it all. On the cross, he said, it is finished. You need to hear that today. Stop working. God's done all the work. It's only up to you to simply receive, repent from your sins, and receive the free gift. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to ask you this today. Maybe you're here in person or maybe you're watching online and you have never repented of your sins. You have never received the free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, our mediator between God and man. Today is your day. You, it's the free gift of salvation. It is the one reason why we do what we do because we care about you and we love you and we want to share with you what God has done so miraculously in our lives. We don't deserve it, but that's why God is God he is a good father and he loves us and he loves you. You need to hear it. Somebody in this room right now needs to hear that God loves you. You might feel unlovable. You are never more loved than you are right now. God's love for you will never increase because he loves you with his whole being. He proved it by dying on the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the free gift that you get to have today should you choose. But God's not going to force you to do anything that you don't want to do. It's a free choice. But I want to encourage you. It is the best decision that you will ever make in your life. It's certainly the best decision that I've ever made. So if that's you, cry out to him today.